The other night, I, uh, I went to a new restaurant in town, a place called the Apathy Diner. Yeah, um, obviously this is a fictional restaurant, so don't start going to Yelp looking for reviews. Um, but I went to the Apathy Diner, and you know, the thing about the Apathy Diner, I didn't really know exactly what to expect, um, but um, it was, well, I'll tell you about the experience. You know, I went to the Apathy Diner and I went hungry. You know, I was, cause that's, you know, sometimes what I do when I go to a restaurant, sometimes I go to a restaurant just to, you know, I'm not hungry yet, but I go there, I guess in the expectation that when I smell the food, I will be. Um, but I went there and I went there hungry and I was ready to eat. And you know, the people who were there, they had a cook that was making the food, but they didn't really have any, any passion about making the food. They weren't in any real hurry to make the food. They just kind of haphazardly threw meat on a grill and some potatoes on a grill. And when they put it all together, it was just sort of a, a pile of meat and potatoes, just no particular form that you could say, oh, well, that's a steak and baked potato. No, I just kind of just this pile. And the, the waitress who was there, I'd like to say that she was doing her best, but she clearly wasn't because she just kind of walked by our table and said like, do you want some food or something? And I was like, yeah, I'd like to, you know, and I kind of ordered and she said, okay. And she kind of walked back and she, you know, put a piece of paper in front of the cook and and then she kind of came back a couple of times, you know, we never got our drinks. We never got, you know, utensils. We just kind of waited there and eventually the food came up and you could see it kind of in the little window there. And, and she walked by it five or six times until finally I said, hey, I think that's our food. And she said, yeah, I think it is. So would you mind bringing it to here or should I? go back behind the counter to get it. She said, oh no, you can't go back behind the counter, health code or something. And so she eventually goes back and she gets the food and she brings it and she brings it out to the table and she just kind of puts the food out there. And she says, enjoy, I guess. She just kind of walks off. And what's crazy is that I went there hungry and there was food there but after spending, you know, 30 minutes in the Apathy Diner, I just didn't really care about eating by the time it got there. And that, I think, friends, is the world in which we live. That the food is here. The gospel is here as powerfully as ever. It is as powerful, it is as nourishing, it is as life changing and eternity making as it has ever been. People are hungry. They're still really, really hungry for it. But there is a disconnect there between the people who want the food and the people who have the food. And I'm afraid that a lot of that disconnect is apathy, apathy. It's a, apathy is a word in English. It comes from Greek, pathos, that this feeling, a, without. And so it's to be without feeling, to be without feeling. And so I think that in our world, that the answer for us, for many of us, as we deal with the idea of sharing the gospel, it isn't just knowing the gospel. It isn't just getting over fears. I think a lot of it is getting past our apathy. And here's the thing about apathy is that you can't just get past, you can't get past apathy by knowing about apathy. Like we could be experts on why people experience apathy. We could be ex experts on why people lose feeling, why people lose their concern, why people go into an apathetic state. We could be experts about that and yet still be apathetic because the answer to apathy is not knowledge, the answer for apathy is compassion. It is compassion. Just as the answer to fear is to know God's power, the answer to ignorance is to know the content of the gospel. But I would say that the single greatest reason that we fail to witness is that we do not have compassion like Jesus did. And I will challenge anyone to say that they do. 
I don't think any of us have the compassion for our world like Jesus had for his. We have apathy. We are much more apathetic to the state of lost people than Jesus was. On your handout, you'll see there's a quote there from John Henry Jowett, and he says, the gospel of a broken heart demands the ministry of bleeding hearts. When we cease to bleed, we cease to bless. That tearless hearts can never be heralds of the passion. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We see this throughout the scriptures. We see that in Exodus, that, that God is, has compassion on his people that he hears their cry as they are in the bonds of slavery and he reaches out to them. We see that throughout the scriptures that God is compassionate towards us and he sends us the word, he sends us the law, he sends us the prophets, he sends a king to rule over his people he eventually, even when that fails, he sends his own son. We see the compassion of the father throughout scripture. And I think maybe the chief example of the compassion that God has for us is found in, in the example of Jesus Christ. I think he is the supreme example. Matthew chapter nine, verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. A few years ago, there was this uh, a series of, of commercials made by Burger King where they took a, a, actors and they put them into a Burger King restaurant, teenagers, and they had one group of teenagers picking on this, this kid, much smaller kid, and they were picking on him. They were bullying him, harassing him, kind of pushing him around, really mean-spirited teasing. You know, they were just messing with him, awful. And they videotaped their, the restaurant's patrons to see what they did. And I remember watching that commercial and just feeling so sorry for this boy, even knowing that this is a setup, right? Like I know that they, these are just actors playing out a part. Like they are, they're, you know, going through scripted lines, even knowing that I felt bad for this boy. And I watched as these patrons in this restaurant, so many of them did nothing. They did nothing. They said nothing. They in no way intervened or interfered in what was happening. And it's, it's apathy. But Jesus, Jesus is just the opposite. Jesus sees his people. He sees the kid who's getting harassed. He saw his people and he said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion seeing what they were experiencing. We see another example from Jesus in Luke 19:41. And when he drew near to Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. I think sometimes, I think maybe the closest I, could, I can come up, to the, up with this is that we have in our culture a lot of monuments to tragedy. We have a lot of monuments to tragedy. There are places that we can go and some of, you know, in our lifetimes, we have seen some of these tragedies happen. In New York City, you can go to the place where the towers fell and you can see, you can go in Oklahoma City. That's probably the one that hit me the hardest. I remember being a kid and seeing that bombing, seeing that federal building, you know, just destroyed. And you go there and you see this set of empty chairs representing all of the lives that were lost on that day. And it, I would you know, defy anybody to not have some emotional experience knowing what happened there and seeing that memorial to it. And, that, and that's, that's what Jesus is doing here is that he knows what's coming for Jerusalem. He knows the judgment that is going to fall on them. He knows the Roman army is coming for them, that that, that city will be destroyed utterly. And he weeps for them. I wonder, have you ever seen destruction coming like that? Have you ever seen destruction coming like that? Because here's what we, we do a lot of times, like, 
with, with four children, um, they, they get very creative in ways to harm themselves. They do. Um, in fact, I sometimes think that, they are, that there may be some sort of running bet who can have the most creative way to harm themselves. Like who can do the dumbest thing on the zip line in the backyard to hurt themselves. So far, I, I've won that one. That's, that's me, but they're, you know, they're trying to take the crown. I'll say that every day. You know, in fact, last week, um, sorry, Dutch, Dutch jumped off of a ladder and he held the, the rope for the zip line under his chin. And he's gonna ride the zip line holding it by his chin. And I'm like, and I see it and I run out to him and I'm like, stop, stop. And you know, he was, uh, he's here today, so he was fine. Uh, I nearly had a heart attack, but he was, he got a really strong chin apparently. Um, but we, I see those things and I want to jump and I want to say, no, stop, stop. We see that, we ought to see that all around us. Like if we're looking, if we're looking, we can see our neighbors jumping off a ladder with a rope around their necks because they're living a life without Jesus. They're going to leave this world without Jesus. And the destruction that they are going to face in leaving this world without Jesus is far beyond what Dutch would have faced with a rope under his chin. The destruction they're going to face is absolute. It is eternal. And we see it. We see it. And and as much as we would run to grab a kid doing something dumb, our feet ought to move so quickly to intervene on behalf of our neighbors. We should have compassion on them, knowing the destruction that's coming. In John eleven thirty five, 35, excuse me, yeah, 11, 35, that's all right. John eleven thirty five. 35, it's, it's a short verse. It's that Jesus wept. He wept. Seeing the unbelief, seeing the unbelief of, of what people had seen with the death of Lazarus, he weeps. Compassion. It's compassion around people's unbelief. So the question for us is, can we overcome our apathy? How do we, how do we develop a burden for people? How do we develop a burden so that we care enough about people so that we will do something, so that we will intervene in their lives? There's a, a magician um, named Penn Gillette. He's half of the magician team, um, Penn and Teller. He's a big, giant man, and uh, he is an atheist. He makes no bones about it. He is an atheist. He is willing to debate people, challenge people, whatever, and he said that one day that he said a lot of times, a lot of times people will meet him and they want to debate him on points about why he's an atheist, why he doesn't believe things, whatever. And he said that one day he was in an airport. He made a video and posted it to YouTube about this experience. He said that he was in an airport and a Christian came up to him, knowing that he was an atheist, came up to him and he gave them, gave Pendulette his Bible and said, hey, will you just, will you read this? He said, I, I know you don't believe in God. I know you don't believe in Jesus, but, but God's real, Jesus is real. And I know that if you leave this world without Jesus, that you will go to hell. And I don't wanna see that happen to you. I, I don't wanna see that happen to you. I enjoy your, your magic and your comedy. And, and I just don't wanna see that happen to you. So would you, if I give this to you, would you read it? And he went home and he recorded this video and with tears in his eyes, he said this, he said, how much, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? See, I think maybe, maybe it's not just our compassion that we need to work on. Maybe it's our hate that we need to work on. Because I think maybe we don't realize it that, that when we believe that everlasting life is possible and we don't tell our neighbors that it isn't just that we lack love for them it's that we hate them. There's no other way you could explain it. There's no other way that you can say, you can't just be like, well, I'm busy. <laughs> no, 
You can't just be too busy. It can't just be like, well, I'm nervous. That's not enough. If you know that they are bound for hell and you do not say anything, the only real answer for that is hate. So unless the world is going to know that we are Christians by our hate, we need to work on our hearts to grow in love and compassion for the people of this world. So there are five points I wanna make, and I'll make them rather quickly, that we need to do to be able to grow in compassion for people. First is we need to face the truth of hell. We can believe that hell exists and we can claim to love our world, but we can't do those things and not share the gospel. Because if, if hell is real, if hell is really coming, then we have to preach the gospel. We have to. I preach hope. In fact, some, I have, I've had a couple of people who've asked me, preacher, you know, why don't you preach a, a fire and brimstone sermon sometimes? You know, one of those sermons that makes you feel that hell's hot. And I'm like, I, well, eh. You know, I, I, I guess I just, I, I, don't, I don't think I have the voice for it, you know? I, I wouldn't, I don't know. But I, I just, I don't know that I, I haven't done that. I said, but my thing is, is that I preach hope. I preach hope because I believe in hell. I preach hope because I think there's something else. I think there's something else. I think there's, there's heaven. I think there's something better waiting for people through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I think we have to preach that if we believe in hell. See, in the face of the, reor, the horrible reality of hell, we have the good news of the gospel that is more powerful than the flames of hell, that is more pervasive than even the eternity of judgment. We have the good news of the gospel. The second thing we have to know is that we have to remember that time is short. We have to remember that time is short, that this life ends. And sometimes this life ends much sooner than we think it will. It ends a lot sooner than we think it will. And what's funny to me is I think sometimes we have a sense of this when it comes to our own mortality. When it comes to our own like mortality, like if you ask people, you know, approaching middle age, how long do you think you'll live, right? I very rarely hear somebody say, I feel like I'll live to be about 105. Right, like there are people who are gonna live that long. I hope all of you do. I hope everyone here lives to be 105, if you want to. But right, we, when we think about our own mortality, it was just like, oh man, I don't know. 80 something, I don't know. Right? Like we can look at the statistics about how long the average American lives, right? But the reality is, is that sometimes life ends much sooner than that. But the big reality is, is this, you know, George Bernard Shaw said it, I think, really well when he says, you know, it's the grimmest statistic that one out of every one dies. He was a mathematician. One out of every one will die and they will certainly face the judgment. And so we have to recognize that time is short. When James picks up this idea, he describes life as a vapor, that it's like your breath on the side of a glass. And it doesn't matter how much you want that vapor to go on and stay there on the side of the glass, eventually it fades. And so it is with our lives. And so it is with the lives of everyone we know. Now I know that's like, you're like, wow, this is a really feel good sermon preacher. I'm gonna leave here enthused, give me, give me time. It's a reality, life ends but it doesn't really. Our mortal life ends, but there is a resurrection. And there's a resurrection for us all. Some are resurrected unto life eternal and some are resurrected unto eternal destruction. But the time in which we can make a decision about which of those places we're going is short. I think the third thing that we have to do if we're going to break the apathy inside ourselves is that we have to spend time in scripture. Again and again, the testimony of the Bible is that God is abounding in love for us. Again and again, we see it, that God is abounding in love for us. When you read through the Old Testament, it's like 
every, every character, every person whose life is introduced in scripture, it's like, you could just say, like, wait and say, I wonder how they're gonna mess up. I wonder how they're gonna mess up. You know, you read about Adam and Eve and you're like, oh, wow, this garden sounds great. They don't have to, like their only work is gardening. That's, you know, a little frustrating, but there aren't, any, there aren't weeds there. There aren't thorns there. Like there's nothing to make their garden where it shouldn't grow. Like this is the best scenario any gardener has ever had. And yep, turn the page and they mess it up, right? You go to Abraham and you're like, oh, wow, this guy's been called out by God. What a special blessing that he has that he can pass on to his descendants forever. Man, this guy, it's great. And he knows that he's going to live long enough to have descendants. And so he faces down, you know, he goes to Egypt and he sees the Pharaoh. And you're like, hey, he doesn't have to be scared. He doesn't have any descendants yet. He doesn't have any kids yet. So he should know that him and his wife are gonna be fine through this. Oh, she's your sister. Man, Abraham, come on. Like every single person through the scriptures, you see them come and fail. And then you see God's abounding love. You see this love for people who have messed up in some really, really, really creative ways. Uh, If you don't read the story of Judah, man, that guy, yeah. People mess up in some horrible ways and in spite of all of it, God is abounding in love. And so should we. Because see, what what a lot of times we kind of do is, and I don't think we don't do this, we don't do this consciously. I don't think we do this consciously. I think we do it subconsciously. We see the way that people in our world mess up We see the ways that people in our world mess up and we know that the judgment is coming and we kind of say, eh, they have it coming. But we kind of do that. Well, Brother Chip, you don't know, my neighbor, he is the worst. He is the worst. He's on his, you know, seventh wife and he's, you know, just horrible. He's just the, the most awful, you know, he, you know, kicks his dogs and you know, plays loud Tejano music in the middle of the night, right? He's just, he's just a horrible, horrible neighbor. And still God with that person is abounding in love, much more so than we are. If we spend time in scripture, if we spend the time in scripture to see how God is abounding in love with people who absolutely do not deserve it, it impacts us because here's the thing about love. Love is not something that you teach, right? It's, it's not something you teach. You can't go to a classroom and sit a student over there in a desk and you stand up here at a lectern and say, this is the definition of love, right? That's a great way to teach a definition, but it can't teach love. Because love is not something that is taught. Love is something that is caught. It's caught. It's viral. And that the only way that I can teach you love is to show you love. I can't just talk about love. I have to live out love towards you for you to experience it and for then you to be able to pass that on to other people. And there is no source of love in our universe like our heavenly father. And by spending time in his word, we see his compassion for people. And we say to ourselves, if God can be compassionate to Adam and to Eve and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to Judah and all of the patriarchs, if he can be compassionate to those people, I can be compassionate to my neighbor. If he can love those people who did things that were absolutely despicable, then I can love my neighbor. And not only will it show you the possibility that you can, it will give you instructions as to how. Give you instructions as to how. Like, you forgive them. Like, you you say, hey, listen, uh, the other night you were playing some music super loud. And, and you woke my kids up and they say, oh, I'm sorry. I say, oh, it's no big deal. It's not, not, not a huge problem. I forgive you. It's not a problem. Uh, I just wonder if, you know, you could tell me ahead of time next time and I'll, you know, my kids will we'll just have a party all night long <laughs> so that you can't wake us up. We'll be up already, right? I, I don't know. That seems like a, maybe overly accommodating 
but uh, you can definitely reach out to them in compassion. Reach out to them in a loving way. The fourth thing that we have to do is that not only do we face the truth of hell, realize that time is short and spend time in scripture, we have to spend time with lost people. When we aren't involved with lost people on a regular basis, it's easy to vilify them, right? How quickly does someone go from being lost to being an unbeliever? Do you hear the difference in those two words? Because lost happens to pretty much everybody at one point or another. Well, spiritually, we were all lost, right? At one point or another, we were all lost. If you've ever had to leave downtown Beaumont when there was a train there, sometimes the train that runs through downtown Beaumont, it, I say it runs through downtown, it doesn't run, right? Like, it's just there. Like, I, the one time I was there, I was like, is this just a monument to trains? Because it's not moving, it's just there. And the way that I normally leave downtown, I can't now. And I'm talking to my phone like, Waze, I need to leave downtown Beaumont. And she's like, good luck. You're on your own because she's just going to run me into the train over and over and over. And I keep telling her, there's a train, there's a train, there's a train. And she's like, I don't care. We were, we were all lost at one point spiritually. We can all become lost physically. And we recognize that, we understand that, and we don't, we don't make that as anybody's fault. I don't see somebody who's looking for directions and say, <laughs> dummy, you're so dumb not knowing where you're going, where you are, right? That's, that's a, I don't make that judgment about somebody who's lost because I recognize that can just happen. What about an unbeliever? Oh, that's a different thing, isn't it? Because to be lost can happen to anybody. It's just kind of an accident, happenstance, lost. But to unbelieve means that you've had a chance to believe and you have rejected it. You've rejected it right there. Just in that simple turn of phrase, someone goes from being lost, which we can all understand, to being an unbeliever, to being a rejecter of the scriptures, to being a rejecter of God's truth. Now, what's my feeling about somebody who's lost? I have, I have empathy with them. I say, I've been lost before, I understand. But the unbeliever, I have a hard time having empathy for that unbeliever because I say, you choose not to believe? Ooh, I don't know. And I'm gonna distance myself from that unbeliever. Now let's take one more turn of phrase. What does it take to have somebody go from lost to unbeliever? How about the step from unbeliever to heathen? Ooh, that's not a word we use a whole lot nowadays. But, but you look through history, you look through history and in the history of the world, the unbeliever has become the heathen a number of times. And you don't, you don't necessarily, you know, you're not gonna start a war or fight with somebody that's lost, right? Somebody's not gonna come by and say, hey, can you give me directions to somebody and like pull out your saber and start like hacking them. You're not gonna do that with somebody who's an unbeliever. You're like, oh, well, you just aren't convinced of the things that I'm, uncon I'm convinced about, so we're gonna have some distance. But, but when they get over here and they're the heathen, ooh, then it's like now, not only are you lost, not only are you an unbeliever, but but you are my enemy. And the scriptures say for us to love them. That we're supposed to love our enemies. Not just the lost, not just the unbeliever, but people who are actively enemies of the faith. We are supposed to love those people. But we, in our minds, in our minds, when we we do that transition from lost to an unbeliever to the heathen. It makes us to where we put the lost at a greater and greater distance. And when we do that, we reject the central message of the gospel. Because Jesus did not come to be the mascot of God's people. He came to be the savior of all people. He came to be the savior of all people. People who are unbelievers right now, people who are lost right now, people who are heathen. He's come to be their savior. And to do that, what did he do? He got involved with sinners. He got involved with traitors. He got involved with adulterers and thieves and liars. 
with tax collectors. He got involved with people who were ceremonially unclean. He got involved with hypocrites. He got involved with people who were completely different for him. Because remember, I said, we've all been lost at one point, not Jesus. Jesus was never lost. Jesus was never an unbeliever. Jesus never suffered from any of those states, and yet he had compassion for people who did. And so should we. So should we. But the only way that we will is if we can spend time with lost people. Now, I don't know what this looks like in your life. I I don't know what this looks like. Most of us, well, I shouldn't say us. Most of you work with people that are lost. I I don't. (laughs) I don't think. Right. Every, all of my coworkers are Christians. One of the sort of benefits of working at a church, you know, right? I never look at Rusty and think, hmm, I wonder if he knows the Lord. I'm confident. I wonder, though, if, if you ever look at your coworkers and think, hmm, I wonder if he knows the Lord. I wonder if she knows the Lord. Maybe it's having a conversation with your own beliefs. Maybe it's a conversation about your own beliefs. Just letting people know that you are a Christian. Maybe that's a starting point. And yeah, that's, that can be uncomfortable. It can be awkward. I know, right? You can do it anyway. Maybe it's going out of your way to expand your social network. Maybe instead of watching like Netflix, we could volunteer at places. Maybe volunteer at places that do good things, right? Like maybe OCS, you know, and and do good things for people and use that as a way to expand your network. Maybe volunteer with, at a nursing home or a hospice. Volunteer at the library, volunteer at an animal shelter, volunteer in places where you will get to meet people. Because if we're going to have a burden for lost people, we need to know lost people. And the last thing I think that we have to do is we have to spend time in prayer. We need to labor over lost people. I, um, I love to hear birth stories. <laughs> I love to hear uh, women talk about the birth of their children, right? I, I've, I've, been, I've been there for, uh, for five. I was there at my own birth also. Sorry, I always forget about that one. My mom doesn't. Um, but I've been present for the birth of five humans Four of them I remember pretty vividly. Um, Haley remembers those four births much more vividly than I do. Um, she has a lot of detail when she tells the story. And, and like I, I think Brinley, is, and in fact, each of our deliver I say our deliveries, I, I know I'm really overstepping. Each of her deliveries that I was present for, each of them got worse. Like each delivery was harder than the one before Right, and, and so she'll tell the story of, of giving birth. And she's like, oh man, I, you had her about, you know, about this time and, and the labor was only really bad for about this long. And then there was just this and, th- you know, and she'll kind of tell it, right? But I love to hear women tell the story of birth kind of in a group because there's this interesting thing that happens and it happens a lot of times when people tell stories together because somebody will be like, oh man, I had birth. my birth. I got it. I went, I went into the hospital. In fact, we had a friend, this was her story that her husband drove her to the hospital. She got into the, you know, into the emergency room, got checked in up to a bed and five minutes later had a baby. Five minutes, like she was in active labor for five minutes. And then she tells that story. And then the next story is, oh man, mine was much worse than that. I was in labor for like six hours and there was like, the contractions were really horrible for like four of the hours. And, you know, then I got the epidural and that kind of slowed things down and then it was better. And then there was like, you know, a lot of pushing for like 30 minutes and then baby. And then the lady comes along and she's like, I was in labor for 12 hours and I never got an epidural. And I was in hard labor for eight of those hours. And then comes the lady who's like, I was in labor for seven days. I didn't have anything but a stick to bite down on. And my baby weighed 17 pounds, right? And it's just like, whoa, each, each time that story just, it's bigger and worse. And we love 
those stories. How much labor? We love those stories because it shows, and I think mothers love to tell those stories to their kids because like no child should ever doubt the love of their mother because they went through that to bring them into the world. How much labor do we put in for our spiritual children? How much labor are we putting in for for the spiritual next spiritual generation? Because there are people in my life that I've been praying for them for years. And and I'm still praying for them. I'm I'm still laboring over their eternity. And there have been other people, like literally, there have been people that I have like literally just met never met them before, never prayed for them a single time. I just talk about the gospel, like even just like a little bit and they wanna give their life to Jesus. And I'm ugh, like, that's like too easy. And not that I'm, I'm not complaining. Well, I'm, it sounds like I'm complaining, I know. But I'm not complaining about it, just that sometimes the labor is really, really easy. But I think some, that probably the reality is that, well, that's like what Paul says is that there are some people who plant, some people water, and some people get the harvest. And I know that when I walk up and I have a five-minute conversation with somebody and they want to pray the prayer to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they want to get involved in church, I know that, that I'm getting the harvest that someone else planted and someone else watered. And we'd probably all like to get the harvest, but that other part is important too. It's important that we plant seeds. It's important that we water. This week... Our young people are going to be going throughout neighborhoods around our church. In fact, on Tuesday, we're going to the neighborhood just south of our church between here and 10, Green something. What's it called? What's it called? Greenway. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, we're going through Greenway. And so we're going to go through Greenway. We're going to wear masks. We're going to keep social distance. And we're going to knock on doors. And we're going to ask if we can pray for people, pray with people. We're going to ask people if they ever considered their spiritual condition. We're going to ask questions like, you know, if you left this world today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? We're going to ask those questions. We're going to pray those prayers. Mostly our emphasis is going to be on prayer. And some of you would say, you know what, I, I hope that that goes well. I hope that that's, you know, that, you know, you all have a, a, an amazing time. I hope you reach a lot of people, but I just can't. And that's some of us who are here today because of maybe because of work or because of, of spirit of physical limitations. I imagine there are a lot of people at home today who are not here because of the potential of catching COVID-19 and the impact that it have on you. Well, let me say this, Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, we're gonna be going into Greenway. In fact, Tuesday morning before we go into Greenway, we're gonna put a, an announcement up on our Facebook page that we're going to Greenway and what time we're going. Would you, would you labor with us? I, I know you, you can't walk through the neighborhood. Okay, that's fine. But that doesn't mean you can't labor with us. It doesn't mean that you can't spend time praying for our, our young people and the adults who are going with them. It doesn't mean that from the you know, security of your home that you can't say, I'm gonna dedicate these two hours to pray for these kids who are going out and praying for people, I'm gonna dedicate those hours to pray for those same people that our kids are praying for. I'm gonna dedicate those, that time to pray for anybody that I know that lives in that neighborhood. I'm gonna dedicate that time to pray for people I don't know who live in that neighborhood that they could know the Lord today. You could, there's this thing called Google Maps. You could go on your computer and you could bring up that neighborhood and you could pray house by house through that neighborhood on Tuesday, just as we're walking door to door through that neighborhood. See, this virus, it doesn't have to stop you from doing God's work. It's just gonna change the shape of it, just changes the form of it a little bit, that's all. So I wonder, I'm gonna ask this question to people who are watching online right now. Are you willing to do that with us? Are you willing to pray with us for those hours that we're walking through that neighborhood. I hope that you're responding yes. I don't have 
my phone open right now to know if you are or not, but I hope that you are because you can be a part of the work that's happening this week, an important part. And what I think will be really awesome, what I think would be really awesome, it'd just be amazing if God worked it out this way. It'd be amazing if this week, as our young people are going through a neighborhood, and we're gonna go through a different neighborhood each day, and each morning we'll post the neighborhood that we're going to, we'll post the times that we're gonna be going through that neighborhood so that you can pray in real time with us as we're going through. But wouldn't it be just amazing to come in here next week and to see the results of that labor? Wouldn't it be amazing if, if after praying for, because we're gonna do it for five days, if you spent 10 hours this week praying for people in our city, if you came in Sunday, and we saw that there have been lives that are beginning to be changed with the gospel. Wouldn't that be awesome to be able to say, you're from, you're from Green, you live in Greenway neighbor? I, I was, I mean, not to boast, not to brag, but I was praying for you this week. I actually, in this, I don't want to mean to sound like a stalker, but I had a Google Earth image up and I was praying for the people who lived in your house I saw your house. It's the one with the, you know, above ground pool in the backyard and you really need to mow, but that's beside the point. I I saw it and I saw your house and I was praying for you this week. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because that's what can happen. That's what might happen this week. I know that that sounds uncertain because it is. And I know with uncertainty there comes risk. It does. But I can tell you there's sort of two ways that we could do this. We can move into the unknown. We can move into an uncertain area or we can move with certainty. Here's the certainty we can move with. We can move with certainty by not going, by not praying. We can send a definitive signal and message to our community that we hate them by not approaching their door We can send a message to our neighbors that we definitely hate them by not praying for their eternity. We can send that message loud and clear this week if you want to, or we can be moved with compassion. John Vassar was a a preacher, an evangelist. He published tracts. He he came from a family that was very wealthy. One part of his dad's family produced bricks at the turn of the 19th century. 17th or 18th into the 19th century. His, his father produced bricks, had a ma- massive brick manufacturing operation. His uncle had a brewery and they produced a lot of beer and John worked for the brick maker and the brewer at different times in his life, but he gave up both and he gave up the possibility of fortune in either of those businesses because he felt called to the gospel. And he went around preaching. For a lot of his career, he was itinerant. He went through Virginia, North Carolina. He actually at one point was a preacher with the Union Army. He was a chaplain in the Union Army and he was, he was uh, captured by Confederate soldiers and released. And he was released and the commanding officer said, we let him go because we were tired of him preaching at us. Yeah. And John Vassar, in a, in a biography written about his life, It shares the story of this one day that he had been going door to door to door, uh, sharing the gospel with people, that he went to this one particular house and he had been to this house on a couple of occasions before and he couldn't get the person to come to the door. And finally on this day, he knocks on the door and he explains that he's there and he'd like to talk to this person about Jesus. He wonders if they, if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And the person through the door shouts, I don't want your Jesus. I don't want anything to do with him. You can save that and you can take it somewhere else. And John Vassar stood there He put his hands on the door. He put his head against the door and he cried. (laughs) And he just wept for the person inside who was going to choose to not just be lost, but to be an unbeliever. He wept for a person who he knew was going to leave this world without Jesus. And he believed in hell 
He had spent time in the scripture. He knew the future that this person faced. And so he stood there on their doorstep and he wept for them. The next Sunday, that person went to church. And he shared the story of how John Vassar had come by his house and wept on his doorstep. And this is what he said. He said that John Vassar asked me if I wanted Christ as my savior. And I said, that's none of your business. He said, and then he wept on my door. He said, I, I have rejected people offering Christ as my savior again and again. I've pushed those people away again and again but I could not escape those tears. I wonder, where are our tears? Are we weeping for a world that's lost? Or are we just complaining about it? Are we brokenhearted about a world that doesn't know Jesus and they don't know what life is like when they do. Because if, you, if you're paying attention to this world of ours, you could look and say, this is a world full of people that don't know their left from their right, that they just don't know. Do we weep for them? Because it's really easy to complain about them when we don't know them. It's really easy to push them away from being lost to being unbelievers to being heathen. But if we weep for them, then our apathy will not stop us for the gospel. Then we will break through our apathy and we will share the gospel and we will see how powerful that it can be. This morning, we're going to have an opportunity to respond. If you would say that you don't know the gospel, that you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I want to give you a chance to respond. You might say that you know Jesus is your Savior, but maybe you're looking for a church home. But maybe, it's, maybe the real call on your life today might simply be that you need the Lord to shake up your heart a little bit. You may look at your eyes and say, my eyes are way too dry. Maybe your prayer today is, Lord, give me tears for a world that is lost. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for men and women like, who have acted like John Vassar through the years, who have counted on you to open doors, who have leaned into the power of the gospel, who have leaned into the power of the Holy Spirit to make a difference in their world. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do the same. But our prayer today is that we would not be apathetic to the situation that our world is in, but that we would be moved with compassion. Lord, I pray that this week as we move from door to door, street to street, that your spirit would move with us, that your spirit would move before us, that people would open doors and open their hearts, that we can share the gospel with them, that we can give them good news that can change their lives forever, that we can give them a hope and a future. Lord, I pray that you would be with our church body that, that can't go door to door, that can't go street to street. I pray that you would create a burden in their hearts that they would say, I, I will be with you in spirit. That as you move through this city, that I will be praying with you every step. Lord, I pray that next week we can celebrate the power of the gospel and celebrate what your spirit is doing here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you will. We'll have a, a word of invitation here as we sing.